everybody. Welcome to the Tricomes Hash It Out podcast. I am your host, RJ Balde. On this show, we feature conversations about trending cannabis topics. We also bring in industry insiders and influencers to discuss their point of view. In this episode, I'll be talking to Greg Flaval about how his passion for affordable solutions, sustainable housing, environmentality, and health led him to design the first ever hemp homes built in the U.S. We'll also discuss the seemingly endless applications of hemp, what it means to live beyond CBD, and much more. Without further ado, it's time to hash it out. All right. Hey, everybody. My guest today is Greg Flaval, co-founder of Hemp Technologies and the builder of the very first hemp homes in the U.S. How's it going, Greg? Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. Good, good. Now, where uh, where are you joining us virtually from? Okay, so I'm virtually over here in southern Oregon in out of a little place called Jacksonville, which was one of the original gold mine towns on the Oregon Trail on the oh, way wow. to the ocean. Yeah. Wow. In fact, that people are a... still, still panhandling for gold around these parts. Are they really? No, yes. yes. Wow. There's still, there's still, still business booming for uh, trolls and, and uh, panners and you know, little, little pieces of equipment to, to go find gold on weekends. Wow. Wow. I've, I have not uh, been up to that part of Oregon, but I would love to visit someday. That sounds Beautiful. awesome. It reminds us of New Zealand, but 10 times bigger. <laughs> 10 times bigger than all of New Zealand, huh? All right. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I, I understand that you happened, or you just so happened to share a birthday with a certain founding father and hemp grower. Uh, can you tell me, <laughs> tell me more about that? <laughs> well, I don't know whether, whether I'm being politically correct now, am I? <laughs> in, this, in this day of liberalism uh, and everything else, you let it rip. say the wrong thing and all of a sudden you've you know, you're getting lynched by the Twitter mob. Right. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> you're totally fine. <laughs> so George Washington Heath um, is the uh, is the, is the backbone of what we do, which is fiber hip. I'm wearing I'm wearing a hip shirt. I have got hip boots. I got hip socks. I got hip undies. You name it. I mean, basically all things hip. There are so many products you can make from hip, um, but it comes from the the George Washington rope style hip. Right, the same hemp that uh, brought the Mayflower across the Atlantic mm-hmm. um, many, many moons ago, and um, which is quite different to the CBD slash marijuana slash hemp inverted commerce that's being grown around this great nation, mm-hmm. um, at, which is a cousin plant. It, 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 it acts differently. It's a cousin plant. So um, we are all about life beyond CBD. Yes, we grow the same CBD hemp here in Southern Oregon because this is like an extension to the Emerald Triangle, right, from Northern California. <laughs> so yeah, right. we have great weather patterns. We've got great boutique flower here, and that culture persists. But to get to the real meat and potatoes of uh, of the economy, we've got to go. We've got to move towards real industrial agricultural hemp. Got and it. that's what I'm grandstanding about, you know, wherever people ask me or give me an opportunity like you guys. Like, hey, stand on your soapbox and let us, you know, tell us about him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> here totally. I am. Totally. Well, I love it. I love it. We will hand you a soapbox any time of the day. So, so I'm sorry, you're wearing a hemp shirt right now? Absolutely. A hemp shirt. Oh, nice. Yep. yep. Made from, it's 55% uh, hemp, 45% organic cotton. Wow. It's nicely. Yeah. I mean, you got to walk the talk, right? Mhm. Oh, totally. Totally. You got to you got to wear your you got to wear your words. How's that? Wear my words. That's what the I like I'll <laughs> coin that one. Thank you. Yeah, wear you my words. That? Yeah, yeah. That first one's on the house always for a guest. First one's on the house. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> yeah. Now, so you're living in uh Oregon right now, you mentioned. Uh and you're originally from New Zealand. And I understand mm-hmm. that you started your career in building and construction in Vancouver, Canada. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Gotcha, I, gotcha. I, went, I, I finished high school in, in Canada and then we moved to the U.S. And I've been building houses for a long time in California. Um, gotcha. And I went, back to, I went back to New Zealand because it was legal to grow in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? But we started we started with Hip Technologies way back 2008 in Asheville, North Carolina. It was 2009 when we built the first permanent hemp house in America. 
and uh, we've since gone on, you know, be involved in many, many, many projects around the globe. Um, we even designed and built a, uh, a proof of concept house for the Ministry of Housing in uh, in Winnipeg, in um, oh, wow. Canada. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, which is still going strong. That's amazing. So tell me how you went from um, your career in, in building and construction to then going on to build the first ever hemp homes uh, permitted and, and built in the U.S. How, what was that process like? So that process was, um, it, was it wasn't actually that difficult. We, you know, building in, in Southern California, in uh, West L.A. area, um, you know, remodels or, or new builds, we'd have, you know, we'd have dumpsters sitting there for all the, all the construction materials to go into. And see a lot of Hispanics drive by in their beat up old truck, dumpster drive, take out all the nails and swear off all the pieces of drywall and get pieces of drywall out of the bin, put them, stack them neatly in their truck and off down the road to Tijuana or thereabouts where they'd build a shack with it. So they were actually reducing and reusing and recycling, right, the stuff that we were throwing out that was going into the landfills. Hmm. And I started thinking, you know, there's got to be a better way, right? And so we started adopting uh, and adapting to that, um, that um, what do you call it, mantra, if you like, reduce, reuse, recycle, and even compost. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then some friends of mine, I was doing a kitchen um, and bathroom remodel for up in West Hollywood. Um, Chris puts on over a glass of wine, puts on, puts on, a, puts on a table her thesis that she was writing from the school called Hemp, the Miracle Plan of the Future. And I said, Hemp? What the F is that? <laughs> yep. Next thing you know, next thing you know, I'm in England um, working with a company to learn all about it. And that's when we moved to uh, this, 2008. Wow. And, and 2008 yeah. is when Hemp Technologies was sort of founded. That's when we, that's when we first started it with my partner, David, who since passed away. Um, and he passed away prior to us learning all about CBD. Right, mm. he, may, he may have stayed with us longer had we known all about the benefits of, of marijuana and CBD. Um, so anyway, we, we carried on, we continued on, and we built. We ended up building the first, uh, um, you know, hemp houses in Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Netherlands, um, all because of a passion for reduce, reuse, recycle. I love that. I love that. And not, not only that, but hemp is annually renewable. And the closer you get to the equator, the more often we can grow it per year. Right? Down in Western Australia, we can get three crops a year down out of Perth, for example. In mm -hmm. New Zealand, it's only one, one crop a year. Up here in, in Oregon and in further north, it's one crop a year. If you go down to Central Valley in Southern California, you can probably get a couple of crops a year down there. Right. right? So it really depends on, you know, on geography. Um, and topography as well, I mean, and altitude. When we go about 1,500 feet um, uh, uh, of sea, uh, from sea level, we start to incrementally increase the THC value in, in the plant. So, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in the mountains of cannabis is great, not necessarily for him, right? Not, I mean, and having, having said that, if, when I start, when I get on my soapbox in the Southern Oregon area about industrial import, George Washington import, GW import, you know, rope hemp or fire hemp or whatever, they all, they pull out the skull and crossbones. <laughs> I say, it's okay. I'm not doing it here. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> chill, chill. Yeah, chill. Besides, which Oregon, besides which Oregon is an open carry state, but so I want Smith and Wesson showing up at my <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> all, all because of my mother's shirt. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh, we hate to get profiled for our hemp clothing. My goodness, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I mean, in the in the reality of it, uh, RJ, the uh, you know the benefits around industrial hemp far outweigh the benefits from CBD. Mm. And you know, the your program is called Hash It Out. Right? So mm -hmm. you're looking for you know transparency. You're looking for you know get to the freaking point, right, on, mm -hmm. on what the issues are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I should sit, sit back and let you question me or, or ask me, but uh, I'm like, get me on this soapbox, let's go. I can tell oh, please do. It. Please so, do. 
Yeah, so we had, I mean, if we, a number of years ago, we did this exercise and calculations and, and survey, and was, we concluded with the university's help down in, in Massey um, in New Zealand, that if we put aside only 1% of the agricultural land in America, or any country for that matter, um, we could we could grow enough fiber hemp to insulate every new home that's being built every year, right? And that's a pretty mm. powerful statement because that's just the insulation that yeah. doesn't account that doesn't bring into context the power savings, the energy savings, and the health savings from living in an alkaline environment such as hemp and lime. Mm-hmm. And the best, although the best use of material is in the, in the thermal walls of the right. Um, we can put it in the ceiling, put it in the floor, but I mean, I, as a builder, I'm pretty pragmatic about what it's going to cost me to turn the key and move into my new house. Mm-hmm. And as it is many, you know, budget conscious person trying to build a house, because we always go over the budget, no matter how um, how fine you you mark your numbers, we, we always invariably go over mm-hmm. in the house, right, or even remodeling. Mm-hmm. But um, using health based building materials, and hemp is but one of those materials. Um, we can we can lower our energy costs. We can lower our healthcare costs because we're living and breathing. We spend eight percent of our time indoors, especially when we're sleeping at night. We're building up our melatonin levels and so forth, and repairing. And to be able to have to be living in, in an alkaline eight point five pH environment, where the lime itself in the walls is continually absorbing all the CO two and all these all these gases. Because lime inherently wants to turn itself back into being a rock. It's come out of the ground of the rock after millions of years of, of compression, of calcium, carbonate, and then it wants to turn itself back into being a rock. So when we're when we're building a house, an average size house, we're locking up six metric tons of CO2 in that hemp that's been grown for three months in the field, right? Wow. We're absorbing way more CO2 than the same acre of tree that takes 10 to 20 years to mature. Uh-huh. And then when we when we when we protect that cellulose matter, which is the inside pithy part of the plant, when we protect that with um, the lime, which is breathable, inherently vapor permeable, we're protecting that vegetation with with a with, with this unnatural material called lime. Right, limestone comes out of the ground, mm-hmm. and this was it's homogenous and self healing, and it wants to turn itself back into being a rock. So it's absorbing, getting harder and harder and harder. And over, you know, when we're using, let's say, um, uh, six to seven tons of, uh, of of hemp in the walls of this, of this new home, we're using another 10 to 12 tons of lime. Well, over the next 10 to 20 years, that lime will actually will sequester another 25% of its own as carbon dioxide. Wow. Right? So if you... Tons of lime has gone into your new house for your mm-hmm. insulation. Um, then the, um, the insulation, then the the, the lime is going to inc- absorb twenty five percent of its weight. So that's another tw- two thousand five hundred uh, kilos or two and a half tons of CO two. That's pretty impressive for yeah. natural material, right? Yeah, yeah. it seems like and, uh, the obvious choice then, if you. If you know that's Uh-oh. the fact, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't dispute the facts. We've also, over a number of years, we've seen um, the value of uh, or the cost of, of health insurance and, and sick days off work reduce because of living in an alkaline environment. Wow. Yeah, I mean these are pretty. These are these are in your face. These are statistics that we've got from years of doing this stuff, right. and we're we even found. That we could mitigate EMF with our concrete. EMF stands for electromagnetic frequencies, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So um, our own place in New Zealand, when we had, we were about we we're about half a mile from a public radio station on a hill, and we have a measuring device. The geobiologist is outside on the, on the sidewalk, and it's gone off the off the chart. Eight thousand milli, uh, sorry, eight thousand microvolts of, of EMF that we're absorbing. As soon as you walk into the hemp house, right, it drops to less than 30. Wow. So we, we found completely by accident that hemp and lime together are so tortuous that they are actually absorbing 
and mitigating that those electromagnetic frequencies, which, as it stands right now, afflict about three um, percent of the world's population. Wow, it, you know, it's it's those um, uh, uh, I, I you know. I guess, for lack of a better term, yeah, yeah, it, it it leaves me at a loss for words because, you know, those statistics are are outstanding. They're extraordinary, and you know, on one hand, it's uplifting to hear that. It's uplifting to hear uh, your focus on again uh, reducing, reusing, recycling, composting, and and finding these healthier alternatives to um, construction and to to home building. But then on the other hand, you know, I personally get this sense where I, I just want to ask people, like, what what took us so long to get to this point where, uh, you know, great people like yourselves are able to do this work, but still are at a point where, you know, advocacy is still necessary. There's a weird juxtaposition there. Unfortunately, remember back in the late 30s, um, Popular Mechanics came out with a statement in their publishing saying the first billion dollar clock in America was, mm -hmm. right? And shortly thereafter, you've got, you know, you've got these other entities from behind the scenes trying to protect their own patch. And so they put out this madness and they put out this propaganda BS that comes through, the, through filters through to everybody. And then prohibition hit, the marijuana tax act. Um, mm -hmm. makes it unviable for farmers to grow uh, hemp. And then when the war, when World War II comes back, you know, it, it's, hey, everybody, all hands on deck, we need ropes for the ships. Go grow some hemp again, right? Then the war comes to an end, and all of a sudden, ah, sorry, we don't need your hemp anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's the same old, same old BS, boo-ha-ha, -ha that's been going on for a long time. People, you know, get weary of this, and they, and they, and they look at hemp, it's, it's bad juju, right? It's right. Like marijuana. People don't really understand the, the, the beautiful medicinal value of, of weed and different strains of indica do different things for different people. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're growing is sativa, right? We're growing a, a cannabis sativa L, which is the um, which is the George Washington style hemp. And I, I, we use GW hemp a lot because it kind of clarifies the difference between a plant that grows you know, six to eight feet tall on a plant that can grow 20 feet tall. Right. right. I mean, you, you run around America right now and farmers are growing, they're, they're planting at a seed rate about, or a, a seedling rate, I should say, of about 1,800 to 2,000 plants per acre, right? Hoping to get, you know, five, six, seven hundred pounds of top flour that they can send up for smoking, right? People mm -hmm. are going to smoke that and get over smoking cigarettes or they're going to smoke that and get better or, for whatever reason, you know, we're growing that, that, that flower. Mm -hmm. That leaves us stalks at the end of the day about um, um, four to five hundred pounds of stalk that's left in the field. We are now picking up sticks, if you like. I'm trying to point <laughs> to pick up sticks, right, from being a kid. Because that, and the farmers, the farmers now that cannot uh, burn their sticks. Um, they're calling us up saying, hey, we've got sticks here. You want to come get them? And I'm saying, sure, we can, we can, we can process that. We're building a fortification plant here in Medford where we can separate the fiber of the dirt. We already have um, requests for the, the fiber going into paper and for the cellulose being ground down going into plastic. Right? Wow. So we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of pretty cool initiatives. So we're taking materials and turning it into something usable, right? Mm -hmm. And speaking of usable, here, this is a paper, this is our, this is our hemp straw. Simply no way. Plastic, plastic hemp straw. We've got um, a whole range of them now, right? These are, you can see those? Yeah. These are hemp straws that will biodegrade within a year. Oh, that's amazing. Right? So, but this is, and we've got uh, um, the car parts being made from from hemp, from the cellulose, right? Wow. Um, BMW, Mercedes, for about 15, 16 years now, all their interior door panel dashboards and glove boxes are made with hemp. Oh, no right? way. I didn't I mean, know that. You did not know that. Even the Viper has uh, hemp in it. 
What? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> wow. Wow. All sort of, and the, hey, thank you so much for bringing prop. You're the first guest to bring props on the show, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for, for no coming worries. prepared with a visual. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, I'm, I'm here. We're, we're getting the word out. And the thing is, yeah. we're using every part of the plant, right? So going back to my seedling rate of 1,800 to 2,000 plants per acre, mm -hmm. and I've given you the difference with that. With the GW hemp, you're planting at a rate of around 30 to 40 pounds of seed per acre. And there's, there's a male and female, right, uh, which is classed as a dioecious plant, mm -hmm. meaning male and female. And you need the males, you know, to pollinate the females, and then they take off, and the males wither up and die. And you've got you've got biomass. Every foot of growth is one inch a ton. Right. And we're talking 14, 15 foot plants at a sea, at a rate at a compound rate of about five to six hundred thousand plants per acre. Huge wow. difference. Two thousand. 500,000. Right. 500, Just so a bit of a difference. There's, there's a huge difference. Four or five pounds of, of stalk or sticks out of, the, out of the current fields that you see around the place. We're getting you know, four to five metric tons of, of biomass out of the field. Wow. Right? Wow. 80% of everything that's, of everything that's grown right now for, in terms of hemp, the, the, the herd is going into animal beds. Right, okay. and I'll explain all the benefits of animal bedding, um, and another twenty percent is going into construction. So that Got number it. has increased a little bit over the last five or six years, mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing we're seeing a bigger uptick now in uh, in the five in fiber style hemp, in the GW hemp for for bedding. But since the start of the pandemic, we've seen a thirty four hundred percent increase in backyard chicken sales. Right, oh, so wow. people think, hey. First, they want to move to the country. Second, they want to have backyard chicken laying in their own eggs, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, so the, the little small chicken chicky bags you see in the in the in the pet store, they've they've got up 3400 percent increase in sales. To go with that as a corollary, people are looking for bedding. Wow. And so we've had we've had a huge up in animal bedding from hemp because wow. the hemp is for chickens. You don't need diatomaceous earth. The hemp will will mask the smell that also absorbs all the all the, um, the poop and the wet stuff and kills mites. Right? Wow. It does all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Wow. That's... But you're not gonna but, you, but you're not gonna get that out of marijuana hemp. Right, it's, right, it's, right. There's a, a clear distinction. Clear distinction, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you microscope up the you know the, these little slivers of, of cellulose, you'll see that they're full air holes like a sponge mm -hmm. and that gives it that good characteristic of being able to absorb uh, the smell breathe um and last a long time we've even we've even used it for oil spill right and the same material you put down on, a, on an oily patch in in your local jiffy in, in your local jiffy load place for example got oil all over the floor you put put some hemp down there on that on that spill leave it there for for a couple of weeks you come back and you take that up; it's absorbed all that, all that mess. Not only that, it's made that cleaner than the rest of the than the rest of the four. <laughs> I mean, it's just like whoa! Blew wow. my mind when we did this. Yeah, we had we we put some in bag three years ago with some hydraulic oil, right, out of a uh -huh. like a um, fourth mm -hmm. And after a year and a half, still the last time I was there, I looked at the bag and it still had it had let nothing go. It, but most absorbers. Will take up and then let stuff go, and the hemp takes it all up and doesn't let it go. It's amazing. Wow. I'm, you know what? I knew that, you know, hemp has a variety of uses. I knew that for a while, but I'm not sure I knew it to this extent that you're explaining to me now. This is incredible information and, and, and incredible insights. I, I want to ask you, what was your process like for? Uh, finding the the perfect formula for hempcrete, and how many iterations of it did you have to go through uh, before you finally landed on the solution that you like? Um, I actually just I, I cut to the chase and you know um, went straight to the source because in England and Europe they 
still with this stuff for you know, 20 years plus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had the I had the first opportunity to go to Paris, France, in 2009, and with my partner David, and we went to an actual hemp house that had had a big fire, two story uh, that had an actual fire, okay. and even the bricks out of the chimney had had fallen off, right? But this everything in this house was obliterated, demolished, the fire. Mm. The four hempcrete walls were still standing. No way. <laughs> Nothing happened to the four hempcrete walls. They were wow. like, so now, so now they've renovated that house, and even the roof has got hemp in it. Before, between the walls has got hemp in it, and obviously they haven't had a fire since. But this was pretty incredible to see this. And their 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 mix was real simple. It's four one one, four parts hemp, one part binder, one part water. So we sell the hemp and we sell the binder, and all you got to do is add water. <laughs> what? Just add water? Hey, if that doesn't sell just product right there, just add water, <laughs> then I don't know what will, man. I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah. So. There has got to be a better way. I love that. I love that. That is so rad. That is so so cool. <laughs> now you mentioned uh, the um, uh, uh, bedding, the the pet bedding. Is that a product that you also sell on Hemp Technologies? Because I understand, yes. I, I looked at the website, uh, and Hemp yes. Technologies offers an array of products and services from you know full-on hemp building to uh, uh, supplies, uh, hemp flour, and then even even pet products. So just tell me more yes. about the the massive, uh, the wide scoping array of of products and services that Hemp Technologies has to offer. So. The, the, the animal bedding basically is the same material that we use to mix lime to build a house with, right? Okay. So we, what we've done in the, in the processing facility is instead of having two different sizes, we've gone to more of a universal size, about a half inch in length material. Mm-hmm. That way we can, we can, we can serve the, the, uh, the pet market as well as the construction area. The, um, the equine use of it is amazing. So although hemp is, is considered a premium bedding product mm-hmm. uh, and you will pay more for it, we actually did this exercise in Australia about eight years ago. I went through a trajectory on spreadsheet for in the field and after 12 weeks, sorry, 10 weeks, we were cheaper than sawdust and, and shavings. Right? Wow. Because we've got lower transportation costs, we've got lower muck out costs, we've got lower labor costs all overall. Right. Um, and lower storage costs, and although more expensive than wood shavings and, and sawdust, um, after, after 10 to 12 weeks, comparing with labor, it's actually cheaper than those other two mediums. Right? And the horse is healthier because they're not going to eat it, very low dust, very good for horses to have um, breathing problems, um, and it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't stick in their hoofs. Right? Oh, yeah. So these, these horses. Actually, once they've used hemp, they won't use anything else. Wow. So the Queen of England, all her horses, all her big, big value horses are laying on hemp. <laughs> wow. No way. <laughs> yes, why? That is wild. <laughs> once you go hemp, you yes. don't go back. That's what they Correct. say. You can't. You <laughs> I can't. love that. And there is actually a, um, a friend of ours, um, uh, John Rulak, who has Nutiva. You've heard of Nutiva. So many years ago, I was putting together a hemp village in New Zealand, and I, he gave me permission to use his video and edit it out you know, the way I wanted to. But it's a very good video with looking up at its bioluminaries, mm-hmm. and it's called Hemp Can Save the World. Mm-hmm. And they have it's a it's a it's an info video um, of the luminaries talking about all the things that hemp can do. You should look it up, and your viewers take a look at it because it's an awesome three and a half minute uh, video on hemp. Save the world. Totally, and we're yeah. actually going to be using part of that in our um, for our radio stuff that's coming up shortly. In some of our um, uh, educational series that we're going out there, hemp can save the world, and it really can. Because if you look at Bahrain, we've got food, fuel, shelter, jobs, medicine, maybe mm-hmm. even world peace. <laughs> hey, I know. <laughs> Which, I mean, based of, on what you're telling me, hemp can solve a lot of problems. So why not throw world peace in there? <laughs> well, let's, let's let's go back to the numbers now. Numbers let's. don't lie. Right? Mm-hmm. So 
we've got we've got a pandemic besides the coronavirus in America. Um, every day throughout this great nation, you have around 20 plus returned vets taking their own lives, right? Mm-hmm. In suicide. But equally, if not more important, you've got 40 plus small family farmers around this country doing the same thing. Right? They just can't take it anymore. They can't get enough credit. They can't feed their family. They can't pay bills. They're, they're, they're in debt. Um, they can't get money to put seed in the ground for next year's crop. Mm-hmm. And and, the, and in any event, they're making two fifty, three hundred dollars an acre net from growing soybean, soybean and, and, and uh, right. So with hemp, with industrial hemp at a hundred bucks a ton, we, they can actually make twice as much money growing, growing industrial hemp, right, at the farm gate. And not only that, they don't have to look around for a marketplace to sell their stuff. Not one right. farmer in America from last year, from last year's growing season. Made it, made came out on top, and made any money. Right? You had suicides. You had you had depressed pricing. You had um, even ourselves. We put uh, we planted CBG when we were eleven hundred dollars a pound for smokable flour. Mm-hmm. In, in the matter of three to four months, once we once we harvested back, so a year ago October, uh, the price was two fifty a pound. Right? Oh wow! So to put it into further context, around this great country. 240 odd thousand legal acres of hemp grow. Mm-hmm. When I say hemp, I'm talking CBD, right? Okay. This sure. is marijuana that's had THC selectively bred down to, to potentially be below 1%. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And of that 240,000 acres, we only need maximum, maximum, maximum 50,000 acres to service the whole demand in America for oh. CBD product. Wow. Right? Yeah. So you can you can see we've got an abundance of material sitting on the ground, right? This year we didn't grow as much across the country. We didn't grow as much because a lot of people got hurt last year financially. They put they they were speculating and they took mum and dad's credit cards, everything they could get out of the bank against the house, whatever, and they put it in the field, mm-hmm. only to be sat down at the end of the season because they couldn't get sales. They were like, who do we sell to? So right. then you had a race for the bottom in pricing, right? So we're seeing the same thing this year as well, but now people are more hip to getting a better quality product, right? Mm. So they're being a bit, a bit more selective in terms of what they're buying, and again, for the least amount of money, obviously, right? right. Well, we're going to have the same issue this year, again, when, pe- when farmers are, you know, Jumping over each other, trying to get to the next buyer for how many pounds they don't know. With mm-hmm. you know, with with industrial hemp, right? We can make a bunch of products that are already being sought after now. Right? Wow! Yeah. They, and we and we just we don't we don't have enough. I've got I've got a standing order for twenty containers a month for horse bedding uh-huh. in this country. Right? Uh-huh. I can't supply it because it's growing industrial hemp. Out there chasing the CBD dollar, right, right, right. Now it's not. I mean, it's not. It may not be a sexy product in growing rope hemp and then cutting it down and leaving it in the field. But you know, within our collective, you know, we do almost twenty thousand acres in Europe. With eight people, eight people, because we're me- we're 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 using mechanized all the way through from drilling seed in the ground right through to, right through to the harvest at the other end. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't need to run plastic and drip tape like we do here, which is totally not sustainable. Right. right. Um, and we clean that field at the end of the day. We put all sorts of microbes and other things into the into the into the soil. We, we're constantly feeding these girls, you know. And we and you know, I feel like a pimp for three months of the year, walking the lines, looking for males to pull out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Means you can't have any males in the field. Right. <laughs> and I, Bonuses, let's spot them and find the hermaphrodites, right? Oh, Get no them. way. Get out of there. Right? Wow. Where, that is... with, with George Washington hemp, RJ, you, you haven't got that problem. You just put it in, you let it go, Mother Nature does the thing. And at the end of, you know, at the end of 100 days, 100 or so days, you're cutting it down with a sickle bar more or uh, uh, just cut it. Lay it in the field for a couple of weeks, let it, letting it feel wet. Which is what the nature doing her thing with the wind, the sun, the rain, and everything else. 
Sure. And then we take it into the processing facility where we're putting it through a big hammer process to separate the fiber from the herd. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we've got bales of fiber at the other end that we can use for automotive or three D printing or whatever, and we've got um, end paper as well, and we've got uh, um, our big, big mountains of herd that we use for broiler chickens. We use them for uh, for pet bedding, we use it for plastic, um, we use it for all sorts of stuff. I mean, I can, I can go get my briefcase and I can open it up for you, Arjun, and I can show you a whole bunch of stuff that we make from him. <laughs> I bet you could. I bet you could. And you know what? I, do you feel like there are even more uses for hemp that haven't been even discovered yet? And are you exploring any... Um, New applications for hemp? Yeah, in fact, yes, RJ. We um, we just about six months ago we did some R D on making graphene. I'm sorry, so say that graphene, again. Graphene. Oh, okay, okay. Graphene is, is a power storage, right? It's it's battery storage. It's mm -hmm. uh, um, compared to lithium, right? Uh, the, the trial that w the trial we did in house, we got 300 milliamps out of our graphene as opposed to 30 out of lithium. It's what? thirty greater than lithium in terms of as super capacitor, and this is hemp. Yeah, this is the inside. This is, this is the hemp plant, mate. And we take it, and we do a few things to it, and we burn it, and we get a you know. I, I made a I made a, you know a fifty five gallon drum um, outside fire pit, right? Mm -hmm. I get some of the, I get some of our hemp. I've crushed. I've shredded down everything else. I soak it in some stuff we, that we learned about. We put it into a paint can, put the lid on, pop all on the top, put it in a soaked fire, and wait for all. And then the gas, sin gas comes out and it's on fire. And once that sin gas goes out, now we've got charcoal on it. Now we put it through a couple of other processes, and we turn it into a, like a paint. You know, we oh, sure. Paint. sure. We've got spark to come along and, and flip up the ends to it and put it through a, put, put it through a diode and turn on the light bulb. Right? All from hemp. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> what? The only way I, the only way I can sit here confidently laughing and talking about this stuff is because we've done it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, it. yeah, totally. <laughs> wow. And, and what what sparked your creativity to looking into that? Because uh, that seems like um, a, a little different from the other applications of hemp technologies. This seems in a in a compl in a different sort of vein or different sort of avenue. Well, we, you get involved in anything that, that steps outside the box when it comes to hemp. Sure. Someone, someone on the team will say, hey, have you tried this? Look at this video or speak to this person. We ended up getting a mentor out of England to help make this first R&D trial. He's actually doing it. with a, he, he did it himself with a bunch of hemp given to him. So, okay, we can try this here as well. We did it on the shoestring. We didn't have a lot of money to put at it, but we did it. And it's like, it's done. Now we've proven it. <laughs> Done. Now we could, now we could scale it up if we wanted to. Again, it comes to who wants to strike to, to make that happen, right? Sure, um, sure. So there's lots, there's lots of avenues. I mean, we're. I want to get. I don't know how much time we have here, but I want to get to talking about the housing because yes, affordable please. housing and farming is a huge issue in this country. Okay. <laughs> Affordable housing, we've just come through, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, come through some really nasty wildfires, and 5,000 structures have been burned to the ground, you know, not 15 minutes from my house. Right? Mm -hmm. We had we had the go bags ready to go in case, in the case they yelled out, you got to get out of Dodge. Didn't happen, thankfully, but a lot of people have been displaced, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been left homeless. Um, they're living in tent cities or they're living with relatives or whatever. And, you know, we've got all up and down the West Coast, this fire season has been decimated, right? Right through Canada uh, on the West Coast, you know, horrific fires. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that comes back to environmentalism. It comes back to state governments not, you know, doing their part, et cetera, et cetera. But we won't get into that. I'm thinking about building these houses. Well, we've, you know, lots of different counties and regions and states are looking at the affordability value of housing. On a very positive note from this pandemic, COVID-19, is that just like after the 2008 financial crisis, which you probably weren't around when you were too young to be around then, 
but we got hurt by it pretty bad, right? And but what it did do in 2009, 10, and 11, it forced people who were out of work, they couldn't pay their mortgages, it forced people to move back home, come back to the family unit, right? Sure. Very, very important. And in this time, in this very trying time of 2020, having family together is really, really important. You know, the kids are losing their jobs, mum and dad have lost their job, or they can't make the mortgage or rent or whatever. Well, the way we've sort of molded this plan, I coined it the boomerang income plan, right? Because, you know, what a boomerang does, you throw it and it comes back, right? Sure. Hopefully you catch it. <laughs> sure, hopefully. <laughs> but, you know, as, as as a baby boomer, right, we've spent 30 plus years paying into a mortgage every month, right? Right. We're growing up the children, they've grown up, they've got married, they've moved away, they've got a family somewhere, you know, far away or close by or whatever. They're not with us, right? Mom and I, mom, mom and I are rattling around in our 2,000 square foot house that we raised the kids in, but we don't need that much space. Mm-hmm. How about we bring the kids home, right, with the grandchildren? Mm-hmm. And let's create that community within our current environment. Mm. Right? Statistically, 90% of people over 65 want to stay in their home as long as they possibly mm-hmm. But why not make that ADA compliant accessory dwelling unit slash granny flat in the backyard on the existing family home site, bring the kids and grandchildren back to the big house, mum and I will move into our ADA compliant you know, smaller you know, self-contained unit. And now we've got a two-way babysitting operation going. (laughs) Hey, love that. (laughs) Added bonus, an added bonus indeed. Exactly. And we can can tap into the equity of our existing home to build our granny flat to our specifications, right? And have it, you know, universally designed, ADA compliant. When I I say ADA compliant, Americans with this, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want things, you know, level step entries. You don't want two steps. You want adjustable height countertops. You want door handles and not door knobs, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want 36 inch hallways and doorways as opposed to 32, so that you know, I got to have a walker or, or a wheelchair. My accessibility is not impaired, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all things come into in the design of it. Counties and regions around the country are addressing this now by lowering the fees associated with getting a permit to build an ADU. And certain regions have max specifications, like in uh, San Diego County, for example, it's 1,200 square feet or 50% of your uh, existing house foot, right? Up okay. to 1,200 square feet maximum. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you go up north to Carlsbad and in Sanitas Way, I only know this because I was doing some work down there on this, um, it's the 600 maximum, right? Up here in Talent and, and Phoenix, it's 800, right, as the maximum. Well, you can give, you can put two nice bedrooms and a, and a kitchen and a living room in 800 square feet. Right. Right? You can be right. comfortable. You're not rolling around and you're living comfortably. And, you know, you can, you've got the grandchildren right next door. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. Yeah. We yeah. love not having to search for a... a um, a babysitter. Just send the kids to the backyard to the babysitter. Exactly right. And as we get older, you know, the, the kids will, will help look after us too. Right. And so this pandemic has, in fact, helped people real, or families realize that they could let's use what you've already got, tap into that, and have the kids pay back that pay back that mortgage. It's going to be it's going to be cheaper than getting another house somewhere else anyway. Mm. Right? Right. And so this led, this has led me to uh, talking to different companies about embracing getting on board with our with our sustainable based building, including hemp. And now we're working with the city of Medford for um, potentially, potentially buildings to use with them. We're working with a prefabrication company so that we can actually make, make kit set homes off site, put them on the back of a truck, take them to where they want to go, um, and have the, have some them on site i mean wow it's really a no-brainer yeah wow I, yeah and that was going to be my question is how uh have you been um working toward uh getting this this strategy or getting these solutions out so it's great to hear that you have uh uh struck partnerships with these organizations to uh to get that to get that out because like you said it seems like a no-brainer 
it is a no-brainer, but it's about the education, Andre. You've got to, you know, right. that's why you've got some you know, some backers federally and state statewide to help us or, or, or support us in me getting on a soapbox to talk to people about life on CBD, right? Totally. There's another way. But we start to, and so I revert back to the fact that, you know, we're, every, we're growing CBD hemp across the country on the, on the whiff of a promise of making tons of money, right? Well, it hasn't happened, obviously. Now we've got a material on the ground that we need to turn into or need to store it, turn it into medicine at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. But the, val- the real value in this in this plant is growing fiber hemp. Not, you're not going to, it's not set, you're not going to make you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on the farm from growing DVD, but mm-hmm. you're, you're hoping on a wind of prayer that you're going to make it now anyway. Whereas right. for a solid, for a solid, you know, solid, um, double return of what you'd be making planting soybeans and corn, you know, you can be part of something much bigger and helping to save, you know, save the planet at the same time because it's environmentally conscious. Because every acre of hemp you're, you're going absorbing CO2. Now we go lock it up right. in a house and we're, and we're sequestering more CO2 with the lawn. I mean, it's, just, it's like I, I tried for a long time to find a downside to this. Uh, the only downside I could find was the uptake. In, you know, the first house that we ever built back in Asheville, North Carolina, um, we ran an educational day for all the local authorities to come along. And at the end of the day, even the fire department was saying, we want to we want to build our next um, house out here because the stuff doesn't burn. We, we get right. a 60% discount on our fire insurance building the hemp. Oh, right? wow. Yeah, and so the, the naysayers, you know, the, the jokesters, the late night comedians, you know, would 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 would, would um, flashlight us or whatever, right, or spotlight us, and you know, these two little piggies in Carolina are building these houses, the house puff and blow down. Ha <laughs> ha, we're gonna have a party when it catches fire, this sort of stuff, right? But it's yeah. not it happened. <laughs> right? It just yeah. Doesn't happen. Yeah. It just doesn't. Yeah, and all the like the proof is literally right before your eyes, and. You know, again, there's no disputing the facts of, of the of yeah. the matter. You know, it, it's yeah. it's unbelievable the uh, the versatility of the hemp plant um, and GW hemp in particular is it's truly astounding. It blows blows me away every time to hear about it, particularly from someone as adept in the field um, as you are. Um, you you mentioned uh, throughout the our conversation here uh, that you sort of live by this mantra of, of life beyond CBD. So I just want, um, I just want to ask you where that sort of originated from. Is that something that you picked up somewhere and then you've sort of adopted or is it like, how did that come to you? I actually, it just came to me. It's, it's not life after CBD. It's life, life beyond. beyond. I'm CBD. sorry. Right. And life it, beyond and CBD. It came, yeah, and it came to me after speaking with, the guy that runs Farm Bureau here in Oregon, right? Okay. And the Farm Bureau is a, is a national organization, just like you know, the grain organization. I've spoken to people, and farmers are leg- called legacy farmers, right? And legacy farmers in America, every day you've got 10,000 people turning 65, retiring, putting their hand out for the Social Security, and, and life goes on, right? Mm-hmm. And we all know that we all know that Social Security is underfunded and is going to go below for the next years, right? Um, but the farmers, the kids, don't want to stay on the farm because they've seen the rough ride that mom and dad have been on the farm. They want to get out of Dodge and go, go to town. Right? Sure. But sure. if there's a way to help them stay on the farm, right, the legacy farmers need to know that they're, and, and legacy farmers are amongst 65 pluses as well. You know, they're retiring. Who's going to take over the farm if it's not a conglomerate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there is a way to pass on, and there's a way to do it because look at that, you know, in his back in the growing, and, you know, 200, 300 bucks a year. Right. It's not going to, it's not going to get a seed for next year, right. let alone pay off the bills and pay the mortgage, blah, blah, blah. Whereas mm-hmm. hemp will literally save the economy, and we can do it all onshore, right? We don't have to be – right now we're in across the Atlantic, right, from Europe, um, which is you know, six or $7,000 every time. Before the water, 
Mm. Right? Well, we can save all that by growing it domestically. Right. And we, and we can put all these people to work. We can be doing all these beautiful products made from domestically grown hemp, but we've got acres and acres and acres and acres of stuff that we can do. Do you know that if we planted just 5,000 acres, for every 5,000 acres of, of George Washington hemp, we can build a million square feet of housing. Oh, wow. I did not know that, but I'm glad I know that now. <laughs> I mean, and, that, and that's, that's a beautiful thing, right? And yeah. which means we can have we can have processing facilities dotted all over the country doing regionally, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of, and so how many how many jobs does that create? I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Right? Totally. Not only that, you're repurposing people for something that they can take pride in and take ownership in. Right? Exactly. We have you know, we, we work with another federal organization called NCAP, which is the National Applied Technology. They have what's called an on to farm program where they sponsor returned vets to repurpose them to go on the land and farm. Oh. Right? That's a national that's that's a national initiative, a federal initiative that's going on right now. Right? Yeah. And so we put together um uh, a sister arm of that, the education that it's IATA. I think the, the girls are putting a website together right now, IATA, I A T H A, which is the Institute for Applied Technology in Hemp and Agriculture. Okay. And through this entity, we are in our classroom right now to, to start doing these podcasts or webinars or Zoom or whatever to teach people and let me let me do what I do best, which is down on my side. Say, rah, 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 hip, hip, hip. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we love you for it, man. We love you. We love you for the work that you're doing and for the uh, the continued advocacy and, and and passion that you put into what you're doing um and, and bringing this bringing awareness for this this plant and it's it's countless amounts of uses that we know of and are still finding out um yes. it, it's such important work and uh, and uh, speaking of the uh the family farms, you know, I I have a personal affinity for, um, you know, local and family farmers out there. And um, it's, it's very uplifting to, to see and hear that you have put an emphasis on sort of upholding the foundation of the family farm, um, something that is so instrumental um, to the economy in this country and economies throughout the, na- or throughout the world. Um, and, and, and that's such great work that you're doing. Um, and we can give you a soapbox whenever you want, man. We are, we love to have it. We love to hear it. We love to see it. And we love the work that you're doing. Um, let me, let me ask you this one, uh, one final question here. Um, uh, you know, for the sake of waxing philosophical, if you will, um, I saw a video of you, um, that was posted in 2011. On the YouTube page, Hemp Fully Green. Is this ringing any bells here? Okay. Hemp, okay. Hemp Fully Green. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're one of our distributors back in yeah. Virginia. Right. Yeah. It was a video uh, that's posted on their YouTube page in which you were uh, calling for people to sign petitions to legalize hemp again. Uh, uh, with an emphasis on again, legalize hemp again, uh, <laughs> and you were doing so while you were in the the caves of uh, I might be pronouncing this wrong, caves of Canabric in Spain. Uh, Can- I'm saying oh, yeah, Can- Canabric. That's Monica. Canabric in Spain. Yeah, and you were yeah. you were attending the uh, the second international building hemp. with hemp oh. symposium yeah. in oh, Grenada, yeah. symposium in yeah. Grenada. Yeah, that's this whole thing. Um, yeah. Uh, and in that, uh, again, in that course of that video, you were calling people to sign petitions to legalize hemp again. So looking back, um, looking back from, from there or even 2008 beyond that to where we are now, what have you noticed about the evolving journey of industrial hemp agriculture and building and where do you see it going in the future? I would have to say that the uptake is getting better and better um i can i can relate to something that happened to us personally back in 2000 and 
2009, mm-hmm. we had started our company called Hemp Tech USA, which is H-E-M-T-E-C USA. And we were very careful. We didn't want to poke our heads up out of the bunkers for, for fear someone would knock us off because we were hemp, right? Ooh, and yeah. it was after about, a, after about a year of that, um, we had a, a marketing company come to give us a little bit of advice. We said, you know, you need to put hemp front and center in your name. Don't be afraid of it because it's going to cut through all the white noise. The white mm. noise is mention the word hemp and they're ugly people. Oh, that's, that's, that stuff right. gets you high. <laughs> right. And I, and I would say to people, you know, if you want to get high on my hemp, you need a doobie the size of a telephone pole. <laughs> 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 so, and it's like they think, oh, well, well okay. Um, <laughs> and so we would, we would, um, uh, we put, put hemp's front and foremost, hemp technologies, and and they were dead on correct there. People started to ask, good or otherwise, probably because people didn't know or understand, they'd say, what is, you know, do you smoke the stuff or what? And then you get an opportunity to respond and start talking about it. Mm-hmm. And people's eyes, you see that coin drop and the light bulb go off, and oh, this is a different plant. Okay, you mean you can build a brick house with it? Okay, <laughs> mate, let's go. Right. <laughs> right. So, right. So it's again, if the uptake is happening now because of CBD, everybody's on their mind CBD centric, right? And sure. the, unfortunately, what we've had is um, we've seen the cannabis culture come across the street to where it's legal to grow hemp. And they've brought that same mindset with them. So, you know, cannabis people have been used to growing under the cover of darkness out in the back block somewhere. Yeah. And, right, and now all of a sudden, oh, they can legally grow it. Come across <laughs> the road, get a license from OEA or the local agricultural, and they're going and growing it right next to their pot plants. Sure. Right? And in fact, a lot of people have probably did, you know, put their pot plants in their in their hemp last year. No, yeah. no doubt. Right? Yeah. But as opposed to industrial hemp, I I can cross pollinate and reduce the THC in your marijuana, but you cannot increase the THC in my hemp. Oh. It only goes one way, right? Interesting. So what's going to happen is you're going to see the industry evolve very, very quickly after all. Farmers have lost their asses. They've, they've basically been, you know, they've, 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 they've more than they probably chew because mm-hmm. they saw signs in their eyes at the beginning of the last season before. Um, and they're looking for outlets for their, uh, for their, um, a speculative um, product, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas with industrial, two thirds of the product is already pre-sold before it goes in the ground. Right. We're not making as much money as selling, you know, two hundred fifty dollars pounds of flour that's been hand trimmed by eight hundred mm-hmm. people out the back. But, right. You know, we're making consistent, and it's right there, and there's not enough of it. We're not growing enough hemp for demand right now. Wow. Right. So yeah. it's a matter of a matter of, and that's that's why I'm so adamant about getting you know life beyond CBD because when the farmers and the people at the gen, you know the general public stop and say, oh, you mean you have a disposable straw? Oh, you mean you can I can put my chickens on here and and and, and, and in fact I'm going to save my chickens by by using hemp because we've proven that with broiler chickens in a six week rotation uh, mm-hmm. growing. That mm-hmm. um, we we have reduced the mortality of those chickens by nineteen percent. Wow! Right, because of laying on hemp, because the, the hemp absorbs all that stuff. Their breasts are drier, their feet are drier, and there's many issues. Right. right? And at right. the end of that life cycle, instead of rice holes that's being used around the country, you walk into the walk into the shed with the hazmat suit on. Right. Mm-hmm. Not with the hemp. The hemp can be can go to local utility. Can be burned up. Wow. Create the oil. Wow. Right? I mean, and that's in Europe, you get a subsidy for growing hemp. It's 1,500 euros per hectare to grow hemp. Uh-huh. Right? That's what we should be seeing here. We should be seeing the crop insurance through the UK. You know, there's some of these, these different authorities can't get their act together in time to help, help, to help the farmers, but it's coming. I mean, it is, it is evolving. It's coming, coming along. We've got 2018 farm bill. But didn't get rid of 
properly for this for this season. So we're still operating on moratorium of the 2014 final, which means Delta 9 above 0.3 or below 0.3 as right. opposed to the 2018 farm bill, which is total THC, right? So because there was so much money invested already across the country, the USDA and the FDA said, you know, just let it go for the next year. So now we're good until October 21, right? Mm. Under the 14 farm bill. Then when you go to total T, most of these most of these plants around the country are hot. They're all above 0.3 after harvest. Oh, sure. The only one that's not is CBG, which comes in around 0.02 or something like that. Um, and a couple of others that have been actively harvested prior to the spike, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. the same thing, to, what farmers don't really understand is if you want, nobody's trying to max out 15 plus CBD percent, right? Or 15 plus percent CBD in their flour, right? The problem is that THC goes hand in hand with it. The only way to guarantee your your crop is below the, th- the federal threshold of 0.3 is to harvest your plants when you're at eight or nine percent potency on the CBD. I see, I see. Right? Because right. it moves again with the daylight, sun, sun, stress, everything else. It moves pretty much in tandem with it. Mm-hmm. So you know, pre-harvest testing around the state country has been, you know, below 0.3. Okay, you can go harvest it. But once you've harvested it, you've had that four weeks, you know, four weeks or so to harvest. Once you've harvested and it's curing in the, in the dry shed and then it's going to get trimmed and everything else, you know, most of them are hiking above 0.3. Oh, uh, I see. So, yeah, there's a lot farmers. I mean, I learned the hard way, right, when growing right. growing hemp. I was all for you when I was a new bit, like, oh, we're going to grow hemp, grow hemp, everybody going to grow hemp. And I could, not take, I could not take a dairy farmer and turn him into a hemp farmer. It was a failure. <laughs> I couldn't take a goat farmer uh, and turn him into a hemp farmer. It was a failure, right? Right. But I could take a pepper farmer or a corn farmer and turn him into a hemp farmer. Hmm. And okay. in fact, when the farmer when the farmer realized and understood and the light bulb went off that if you follow a food crop follow or follow the hemp crop or the food crop, you'll get a twenty plus percent increase in yield. Damn. Hemp is freaking amazing, man. <laughs> it's like it's like, is there any bad news about hemp besides uh um Besides governmental, you know, lapse in, uh, I guess, facilitating the, the growth of the industry. RJ, it's all about education. Yeah, right? it is. That's why it? we're so we're so focused and pretty pretty determined on the educational aspect of it. Because you start, you know, um, um, expose people to the overview, the thirty thousand foot overview of. Uh, the optics on actually all the things you can do with industrial hemp, mm-hmm. including the roots, by the way, right? Mm-hmm. Now you've, you've got a, a regenerative, you know, annually renewal crop that we can now turn, turn our attention to making all this stuff domestically in America. We don't need China and India and, and Zimbabwe and all these other countries to bring stuff in. We can do mm-hmm. it all ourselves right here. Right. Right? Well, so I. Shelter, Jason. You said it. World peace. Hallelujah. World peace. I'm, hey, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. And I am on that train. I will ride that hemp train all the way to world peace. That is for damn sure. <laughs> well, Greg, hey, man, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and sharing this amazing, uh, unique perspective on the extreme versatility of of hemp and it, its many applications and how you know using hemp can really facilitate a, a better life better health better physical better mental health uh better environmental health and uh eventually world peace and you know what i am looking forward to soon be powering my laptop uh with a hemp battery <laughs> That's doable. It's achieved in our lifetime. For sure. Yeah. Well, I'm stoked to see and it, man. The demand, the demand for electricity or battery storage is is is, is exponentially increasing. Yeah. Right. 
totally. As we move towards elect- electrical, you know, um, requirements more. Everything around us coming with electricity. Electricity. Well, hemp can even do that. <laughs> I'm all for it. I'm all for it, man. Thank you so much for your time, Greg. I really appreciate it. Please, please, please keep up all of the good work that you're doing at Hemp Technologies. Uh, never stop innovating. And hey, whenever you need a soapbox, you got my contact. Uh, okay. We could we could hook Sweet. it up again virtually. And please, whenever you've got a new breakthrough, anything going on, feel free to reach out. And uh, I'd love to have you on the show again, man. Thank you, RJ. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, All you right. too, man. Stay safe. See you later. Bye-bye. My thanks again to Greg Flaval for joining me. If you are a member of the cannabis community and have a story you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach the show at hashitout at tricombs.com. You can help others find the show by taking a moment to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at tricombs.com and following us on all social media. Hash It Out is produced by David Fortin and presented by Tricombs.com. I'm RJ Balde. Have a good one.